The initiative comprised collaborations with 22 organizations across Burkina Faso, Kenya, and Uganda. And as I mentioned earlier, Global Fund for Women was committed to providing core support to our grantee partners uh, in order to help build technical capacity, their overall capacity to reach their beneficiaries, to provide resources to support convenings, the sharing of learnings, and of course to facilitate the collection and tracking of information, data, um, the work of our grantee partners in order to ensure that the learnings could be shared across organizations. And so all of these various forms of support have contributed to a number of learnings for our grantees. We're going to hear from Violet in just a minute. Um, but not only those organizations and their institutional knowledge, but of course also the role women beneficiaries with whom they were working and the supporting organizations such as ours and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So really quickly in terms of the goals of the initiative. Let me give you this framework and then again we'll dive much more deeply into the specifics. But just to provide you with an understanding, um, the goals of the initiative were really centered around four things. The first was to improve agricultural productivity. The second was to decrease poverty. And the third was around advancing women's social position. The work of the Global Fund for Women in providing core support to these rural women's associations and networks um, was really centered on a belief that we could strengthen their ability to provide information and resources as well as technology to their members and the beneficiaries that they served. By providing an integrated approach, by combining a sustainable agriculture focus with women's human rights, uh, we really brought to the table a, um, a critical nexus for addressing the complex challenges that are faced in Africa by women farmers on a daily basis. Finally, a key goal, as I mentioned, was really around generating research findings to be able to combine the stories, uh, to combine the information that we were gathered. Really, we wanted to help shift the way people were thinking about making investments in women, making investments in grassroots women-led organizations, and shifting their priorities towards addressing both structural and cultural barriers to improve food security at the grassroots level. And so these women, as we will hear about in just one more moment, showed really what's possible when we support them and we trust them. So with that, I'd like to introduce Violet Shibutse. Violet is the director of Shibuye Community Health Workers. She's the founder and director of that organization, which she founded with 15 caregivers in 1998 and has since helped grow that network to over 1,800 caregivers. Uh, Violet has been championing activities that enhance the participation of grassroots women in their communities and understanding the sustainable development goals, which we discussed on our first Voices of Equality webinar with our CEO, Masimbi Kenyuro. And she is focused on setting their local priorities to ensure implementation of the SDGs. Violet's group participated in our Women in Agriculture initiative funded by uh, the Gates Foundation and Global Fund for Women. And she currently sits on the UN Women Global Civil Society Advisory Group and the UN AIDS Global Coalition on Women and AIDS. Violet, you have achieved quite a lot. I am absolutely delighted to turn this uh, program over to you. Thank you so very much for your willingness to join us today and to speak to us about the work and your achievements. Welcome, Violet. Hello. Uh uh, small funds, that's what I always start from. How small funds make a difference in women's uh, lives, especially around women livelihood and women rights. Uh, so um, my organization, Shibuya Community Health Workers, was among the 22 organizations that were selected by uh, Global Fund for Women through application process to implement the Women and Agricultural Initiative project. And uh, in Shibuya, we had uh, our, also our own um, overview that uh, made us start this program. One was that we wanted to improve food security and nutrition at household level in women-headed households during the seasons of the year. As you heard, Shibuye is an organization that works with, that was started on a background of uh, caregiving or community health work. So most of our women are households that are affected with HIV AIDS who are usually vulnerable and sometimes food security is a, is a big issue 
for them. So we we actually started. Uh, we, we 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 also had another um, objective, which was to priority to the priority to households where women are affected with HIV. I mentioned it. We also wanted to enable accessibility of women farmers to agricultural extension officers because in my community usually women uh, lack uh, access to agricultural extension services because they are small scale farmers who usually are not the priority of the agricultural extension workers. So when they are organized in groups then it becomes easier for the agricultural extension workers to reach them as a group. So we wanted them to actually be able to influence the agricultural technical support. We also had a big problem where most of our women households were being denied accessibility to land, especially through inheritance. And that was also another focus to show the relationship between women land rights, HIV AIDS, and food security, which actually worked well in this project. Our main goal was to demonstrate that rural women living in poverty have the power to produce adequate food for their families and community. The second goal was to demonstrate that investment in women farming can be a solution on addressing poverty. The third one was to ensure that food produced by women is properly managed, consumed, and it's also a source of income for the households so that it's not just uh, food for consumption, but how can we use agriculture to enable women to start looking at agriculture as kind of business, as a livelihood, where they can be also able to raise their family incomes. This, this, the fourth, sorry, yes. So how we decided to do this project was to organize our women farmers in collective women farming groups, where the 25 to 30 women were put in a group, and they identified a demonstration plot, where we, which was called a learning resource center, where the agricultural extension officer would come, and also the women would be meeting and sharing their knowledge, because women also have their indigenous knowledge that they also uh, can share among themselves to improve their their, their food uh, practice skills. The second we have rainfall, and after some time, the rain goes, and the women, uh, because they don't know how to harvest water, or there is no comp uh, a concept of education, then the women don't uh, have food at that time. So we wanted to see how we can have women to learn the drought resistant farming so that they can plant food throughout the year. And some of the food that we identified during that time was like yams, uh, uh, trained so much on uh, grassroots women uh, uh, having to be able to produce food like cassava, which can stay for a long time in the family if they, they if the, if it's stored well or if they learn how to do to, to, to store the food well. The other thing that we looked at was post harvest management. Usually in our community when we had trained the women on uh, uh, the planting and uh, being able to have drought resistant farming, we had a time when women had a lot of food, like they harvested so much food, but storage for this food was uh, was a, a, a problem, and most food went to the road, to rotting. So in 2013, we, we thought we would do something different by working together with the agriculture extension officers to train women on post-harvest management, crop preservation, and food storage, including methods like uh, women would be able to change the sweet potatoes into the crisps, they would be able to make the uh, uh, some juice that would last for some time in the house, and uh, they would also be able to to change like uh, the, the the cassava into flour, which actually worked very well. So we looked at how could we improve post harvest management, and in post harvest management, because our women are very careful, we are working with the women who are affected with HIV, 
Some of them are on ARV medication, and usually chemicals don't work well for them. When food is stored with, a, with, with chemicals, like with a preservatives that are made with chemicals. So we looked at what other ways that were used in the indigenous with our grandmothers on storage. And one of the things that came was construction of silos. As when food is stored in a silos, at least when it's dried so well, especially cereals, and it's put in a silos, then it lasts longer and you don't have to put chemical in uh, preservatives to, to store the food to avoid weevils. But the food stays for a long time and the women can keep using this food. So we met silos and uh, we, we, we took the women for a peer exchange to see where silos were working well also. We also looked at how women livelihood, I, would, I had mentioned earlier, would improve through agriculture. Now that women have learned and they are able to, to produce food, because initially the biggest problem we had, at, as I had mentioned in inheritance was, we helped uh, women uh, who had been disinherited to access their land. But whenever they accessed this land, they would still lease it to other people because they didn't have startup kids. And we wanted to see how this land can actually be demonstrated to be for food production at household level, but also as a livelihood. So what was the biggest gap in livelihood was how women access markets. We have women who sit at the market, senders, who have stores, they buy food time to time, but they don't know where to get uh, fresh food. And now that we had women farmer, we did uh, a, a meeting with the women farmers and the women at the market to see how best these two groups of women would work together and how even women would access stalls at the market to sell their food. So we ensured that uh, the women had stalls and we were able to get three stalls after dialoguing with the government uh, in Shinyalu and Malava. In Shinyalu we had two stalls, in Malava we had one stall where the women have continued to sell their farm produce. The stalls were uh, acquired with the county government through negotiation and dialogues and actually women showcasing that they are actually producers and they also can improve their livelihood uh, through farming. 25 uh, each of these groups, uh, we had five groups. So this, among the five groups, we selected five women farmers, five women uh, from the, the market uh, traders who helped us to carry out a survey around issues uh, that uh, revolve around market and they were also able to support in training uh, on market survey uh, to, to identify where food, certain food was lacking, like if these women have, uh, have wheat flour or have uh, uh, cassava flour, where can they sell their cassava flour, which market does not have the cassava flour, which actually worked well, very well. We also did a financial recording where women recorded the farm producers they harvested. They also recorded how much they were selling. And uh, with this, just to add, we even had women starting to go to other literacy classes so that they would be able to know how to record their farm produce, which actually worked very well. What were the achievements? The achievements were 10 women traders working hand in hand with five women women farming groups to track market for produce, which I had mentioned, that uh, we now have a strong group, and it's called a Women Market Caucus Group, which works with the women traders and women farmers. And they're working so well, and the women traders can actually access food and understand where we have, uh, uh, the women have harvested or where there is food to bring to the market. We also have two collective women farming groups that have established catering services because another way to sell food is when you have catering service, then the women will identify if there is a funeral, if there is a, a wedding, or there is a, 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 any function or event in the community where food is required. So instead of them selling small, small foods that is raw, they would then go there and cook and be paid for the food they brought and also for the labor, which has actually worked so well. This group, these two groups are really demonstrating how women can actually have a chain trainings 
through agriculture that can enable them to access a stable livelihood. And the women have bought even tents and chairs that they, from this uh, uh, catering service that they are now being hired and they can go with full their tents and their chairs and also food. Uh, we have 125 women practicing indigenous post-harvest, which uh, is actually really working well because every time we have uh, agricultural uh, support for women or for community, we rely so much on knowledge that is being experimented. But we really insisted on women learning indigenous uh, ways of farming, indigenous ways of storing food, which now we have 125 women who are not just practicing, but they are also training their community on the same. We have enhanced voice of women in issues of agriculture, agribusiness, and women land rights. Right now we have five women that are sitting on agriculture stakeholder committee at the district level, which actually was not heard of because this was a space for big farmers, for farmers especially who are men, who are producing a lot of food like coffee, who are producing tea, cash crop, sugar cane. But now the women demonstrated that through their collective farming groups, they are key stakeholders in farming, and they have been selected to this uh, agricultural stakeholder committee, and they, where they prioritize their own issues and influence how agriculture programming is happening. Five women from collective women farming group were selected to represent uh, on various committees, we have women who sit on women enterprise committees because the women farmers have also, through their groups, been able to learn how to do savings and lending. And they are working, looking for the existing resources that top up their saving, like the women enterprise fund. So we have women sitting on women enterprise fund. We have two women sitting on poverty eradication committee. And we have also a woman who sits on a big fund that is really political. Initially it was political called Community Development Fund, which is entirely for all the development in the community. Um, we also have viable income generating activities that have surfaced. I've mentioned about catering service. I've mentioned about savings and lending, which are very strong. I've also mentioned uh, uh, other activities like where women plant a similar crop like vegetable and they take to schools. Women are learning to also look for tenders in school. So out of this, we have very strong uh, entrepreneurship that has expanded. Uh, we have strong collective voice, common message among Shibuya. Shibuya is an organization that has mainly been working on women reproductive health, especially HIV AIDS, women land rights, and uh, are now women and agriculture, food security. So we have a message that speaks every time to our government to show the relationship of these three and that we cannot address development just looking at one pillar. When we are addressing development, it has to be a collective response, a, collect, a holistic approach that ensures that women are accessing their land rights, women are accessing food security, women are also taking care, being taken care of their HIV AIDS status and how one influences or spearheads the other. Six women have been trained on agricultural, uh, educative agriculture, not just by Shibuya, but we were also able to link with Bukura Institute of Agriculture, which has been training scholars, but now women were able to go there to learn a comprehensive uh, irrigative agriculture I think I've mentioned the key achievements that we have. We have many achievements, but uh, I would just mention those few. Uh, in this project, we had some challenges that we experienced. And uh, one of the challenges was over dependency on maize for stable food. Our community relies so much on maize. And when you bring women together in the first place and train them how to plant sweet, pot sweet potato, cassava, which can actually be planted on a small scale but produce quite a big amount of food. It was hard for women to accept in the first place because they thought if we don't have maize simply, then we don't have food because we, we rely so much on ugali. But over some time it is changing and women understand how other foods can, can actually increase food security at household level. But that has been a challenge which we are still working on. Most women have small animals like chicken, 
which do not make enough manure. This project, we actually really tried to use compost manure to become really organic so that we would have food that would be favorable for women who are ailing and with various uh, 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 complications like ulcers because they are taking medications. We were very careful. So some women could not manage because like chicken does not have enough manure uh, for, for, for using on farm input. Uh, we also had lack of resources for big facilities for water storage. Um, like uh, this project actually had was a small fund to support women agriculture initiative and water harvesting like our target was to harvest water even from the roofs of the schools, to harvest water from the churches, and we didn't have these big tanks because they were very costly. So that uh, actually was a, a gap in irrigative agriculture. Or we needed to dig big boreholes where we would put all the water that is flowing on the road and be used for consumption, which was quite expensive when the uh, water engineering were putting, it looked very expensive for us to manage. And we utilize potentials like heavy rain, irrigative agriculture, I, I think I've mentioned that. And there was also involvement of women in agriculture decision making. It is still very low. Most of the women have now been recognized by their chiefs at locational development committees. They have been recognized at their constituency level, but we don't have, it's not very formal. It's not like uh, uh, we have a slot that is a policy that says, like, on every agricultural committee, we should have two women or we should have three women. It's not that. It's just that you advocate, you lobby, and then you are given a position which changes when a, another uh, officer or senior person in government uh, uh, goes on transfer, you find that the role is changing because it's not fully institutionalized. And it's, we also lack women at the national level decision making, unless they are academias who are employed by government. We don't have the grassroots women farmers sitting to inform the national government when they are making policies, when they are making uh, uh, programs around agriculture. So often the programs that come do not come to complement the efforts the women are doing in agriculture uh, because of this. Thank you okay. so much, Violet. Yeah, we can take a pause right now um, and allow people to gather their thoughts. I wanted to just do a, a bit of a summary around some of our key findings and then open it up to questions. Um, and I wanted to start with a quote from one of the beneficiaries in Uganda who said that we are now having three meals a day, which wasn't the case before Global Fund for Women's Project. We sometimes used to have one meal a day, and in the worst cases, just tea. And I think that if we think about our own lives and experience and try to put it into that context, um, and, and yet that's the reality for so many, and so much of what this, is, this initiative was able to do um, was, was not only show, of course, how valuable the uh, direct support can be to organizations such as yours, Violet, working with women in their own communities and, and fostering indigenous solutions to, um, to, to really challenging problems, but also that when you combine a look at food security with women's rights, you're actually making much deeper and much more sustainable, uh, long-lasting change possible. So really quickly, again, um, providing unrestricted support, looking at culturally appropriate responses to the communities and the situations uh, that these women face every day. And one of the key uh, outcomes that we're, we're just incredibly excited about was that over 65% of those involved in this work reported that they were eating at least three satisfying meals a day, so getting beyond one meal or just tea. Um, incredible work and many, many kudos to you and the other women that you worked with to make this possible. From Global Fund for Women's perspective, we wanted to highlight some of the key accomplishments across both of the phases of the uh, of the initiative, um, particularly around the ways in which the beneficiaries talked about the strides they were making toward ensuring food security as evidenced by uh, what's already been said, um, and that the crops they prefer to grow um, indicated their prioritization of staple over cash crops, and they expanded the diversity of their diets by increasing the kinds of fruits and vegetables they were to, able to eat, whether it was the 
potatoes or other forms of foods, um, they were able to reintroduce and then rely, as you had well said, much more heavily on indigenous and drought resistant crops because of course when rainfall is a challenge you want to be able to ensure that your crops are going to grow. Um, and then that access to market piece, um, enabling women to take uh, their extra produce to market and earn cash. So those really combine to highlight some of the key accomplishments over the four years that we were able to experience and I think that you so well exemplified uh, in what you spoke about, Violet. Um, I think that you know, the one other piece that we always want to highlight is that when women are able to take this kind of an initiative, um, participate in something larger than themselves, generate their own kinds of solutions, they start to earn respect from their partners, from their families, from their communities. Um, and as, as you can see, when women are able to claim their economic independence, they have much greater control over so many other aspects of their lives and that's empowering for them, that's empowering for their children uh, and that makes a huge difference towards the kinds of gains that we want to see for women around the world. So just again really incredibly excited to have been a part of this um, and really helping to facilitate women, uh, the beneficiaries, um, working with uh, governments and others across sectors in order to say that we can achieve success and we can do the kinds of things that are going to generate success for our sisters globally. So as we're all thinking about uh, the kinds of things that we can do to participate, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. Um, certainly for everyone on this call, stay connected with us. Um, continue to look at our website for the stories. We, after this call, will send out the summary, the executive summary of the initiative to share with you um, so that you can continue the dialogue and deepen the exchange. Uh, we certainly are recording this webinar and we'll uh, make that available to you as well to share. Um, by Violet, your perspective and insights are incredibly valuable as people seek to have a conversation about what food security means today. Um, and certainly we can support organizations that are paying attention to the specific needs of women and children. So with that, I want to open up the floor to any questions. Um, and first, uh, I think that we have Eva uh, on the line um, and she's asking you, Violet, how do you think that the work that you have achieved and the successes that you have achieved could be scaled up to other communities? I, I think one thing that uh, we have really been uh, uh, using to scale up is peer learning and exchange. And that is one very successful concept that was put in the Global Fund for Women, uh, Women Agricultural Initiatives. During even our national convenings, we went to other uh, communities that were closer to where we were convening from. I remember we went to uh, Kiambu to a group called the Daughters of Mumbi where we saw practically what these women were doing and how they were relating with the agricultural extension workers and the government and the entire community which we learned so much and we were able to replicate when we went back to the community. So one way is um, uh, peer exchange. The other way is the TOT, Trainer of Trainers, is a very successful model that we have used, not only in agriculture, but even in HIV AIDS, uh, in advocacy in women land rights. When you train women as trainers, then they become the resource people in their community to continue training their communities. That is expanding uh, within the communities, and they also are resource people that train even outside their communities. You can send four women to a community that wants to start working on agriculture and they train them through this care or they work with them for a, a draw a calendar or a work plan that they work with them for a period. And I think this project provided an opportunity for so many trainings as Rina has mentioned that uh, one of the things that was very successful were training which were not driven by Global Fund for Women was let women train what they think really adds value to their, their work. The other thing is uh, when the women did data collection and we have this information, we attended the feedback meeting which we got the information that was brought back to us from Global Fund and uh, we had a validation meeting. So using this information that we have had, we have been using this to advocate like during the uh, World Food uh, uh, Day or uh, International Women's Day like uh, yesterday where women use this information to give to the governments 
or uh, people, agriculture officers, to show how much women can can produce as farmers, and that that helps to make government develop interest for expansion of such projects to other communities. Violet, thank you so much. Um, I know. Sorry, hold on one second. There we go. We got questions. <laughs> um, I know that you can speak powerfully to this. Um, you know, one of the sustainable development goals is, of course, around poverty alleviation. Could you address your experience of this initiative with women um, and women's access to land and land rights um, relative to that larger goal and objective? Yes. Uh, one of the things, as you had mentioned in the, our our in the introduction, is Shibuya is one of the organizations that has uh, been using any existing development frameworks like the sustainable development goals, our own, uh, our own development frameworks like we have the county development integrated plan, we have our Kenya Vision 2030 to really localize and see how best the women priorities are fitting into this uh, process so that it informs the process or it informs the policy on uh, what the policy is actually supposed to realize at the local level. And I think that has actually been uh, uh, the, 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 the sustainable development goals opportunity is actually a very big opportunity for us at this level where we have tested and have shown that one of the biggest call is to ensure that uh, we are eradicating poverty completely in the world. And we cannot eradicate poverty if we don't look at women small scale farmers as a source of power that can change and transform their societies and that can actually really quicken the process of realizing the, millennia, the sustainable development goals. So we have been using this advocacy, this message, to look at the sustainable development goals, especially goal number two and goal number five, that is uh, goals that ma really matter to us and see how much do we uh, really uh, prioritize what are the targets for these goals and how can we even simplify these targets to really speak to our local colleagues. Uh, during last uh, year, the rural, International Rural Women's Day, we had a very big celebration and this celebration the women were wearing t-shirts just to say if the sustainable development goals are the goals then we are the goalkeepers, which actually speaks to show that the women are not just looking at the small agendas. The women are actually know very well that we are contributing to the larger agenda of the global, uh, at the global stage, and we need to be recognized as key players in development and not just as beneficiaries of development. That means we need to be in the decision making uh, or around the sustainable development goals. We need to understand the development goals, and we need also to be the ones monitoring. Uh, the sustainable development goals implementation. And I think that is the message that we have been using in the sustainable development goals process and looking at the other development frameworks. Violet, thank you. I think that there are a number of incredible quotes in what you've just uh, in what you've just articulated, and I wanted to open up to a question that Masimbi has for you, and I think it's actually a very timely and important one for us to consider. Mm -hmm. Hi, Violet. This is Masimbi, and I come from the same community with you. I'm very pleased yeah. to hear what you have just said. Uh, where are the men? Are the men noticing what you're doing and are they joining on the efforts to make agriculture more prominent in the community? Yes. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, is actually working very well for us, especially when we started working on women land rights, if you work on women land rights just as women, then no one takes you serious. Because women land rights is not just about women. Women food security is not just about women. It's about uh, livelihood. It's about la uh, enabling the entire society to actually have food on their table or have food even for buying from their close neighbor. So as we train the women paralegals, we also train men who volunteer, who are uh, volunteer and feel that uh, this agenda is very important for them. Of course, it's after advocacy. It's after lobbying. Like the last training we, we did with the Global Fund for Women Agriculture Initiatives, which was both on food security and women land rights, we trained even our chiefs 
four chiefs, and now they are completely part of us, they help us even in guarding these demonstration plots, because if the demonstration plots are not fully guarded by government, like a resource, a learning center, where the entire community is learning from, then they, are, they, are, they will be tempered with anyone or animals will eat and no one will care about it. So we have been strategically involving men uh, in a way of lobbying and then bringing them in as real supporters of women. In this household where we have women living with HIV AIDS, and we have, because these are poor households, we have their sons who are in school, uh, uh, and uh, they need to also help their parents or their mother to work on the farm so that they are able to get their school fees. So we do a lot of sensitization for the men, and the men have started coming. Of course, Kenya is still a very patriarchal society, but we have seen committed men. We have even seen the agricultural extension officers. Most of them are male for sure. Our agriculture, like I would say, in Shinalu, all the agricultural extension officers are male. But now they are the ones who are really bringing women to the forefront in their committees. They are using the, men, the women collective farming plots during the field days. The field days that have been conducted in the last two years were conducted in homes of women, and men were also coming to learn from there. So the men are also learning a lot from our, our, our initiatives, the practice itself, they are supporters, and some of them are participating in the implementation, which is still a small scale, but we are really working on it. Thank you, Violet. Um, uh, for those on the webinar, we at the Global Fund are very, very proud of this agricultural project that we were able to do and support in Kenya, in Uganda, and in Burkina Faso. Uh, the intention of it was to try and get um, what women learn together when they are in a, a cohort model. And I think that Violet has really demonstrated to us what this cohort in Kenya learned together. But there was even a bigger picture that they also learned together with women from West Africa in Burkina Faso. So Violet, I just wanted to say to you that I, we are very proud of you uh, being able to illustrate to us the achievements that you made within the Shibuye. And I hope that you can be able to think about how you can be able to expand that project beyond Shibuya to the rest of the, of, of the country. So thank you very yeah. much for your contribution. Thank you too. I really appreciate your support. And uh, we, these are things that we are able to sustain for a longer time in the community. Thank you so much. Violet, hi. It's Chandra again, and I just wanted to provide you with an opportunity for any closing comments or uh, ideas that you might have and that you wanted to share with those who have gathered for this call. Okay. I think the uh, last thing I would say is that uh, grassroots women are actually real change agents. They are not beneficiary of the projects. And if they are involved in planning and designing the projects, like how Global Fund for Women did, like having convenings where the women are speaking and really prioritizing what they want to do. I think they can really be very good ambassadors of change, and we can realize uh, the development agenda very quickly. Uh, the other thing that have actually been um, um, uh, that I've been observing in uh, development, particularly in most of the people that are partner or fund uh, grassroots women they don't value organizing. And unless women are organized, like when I talk about women in groups of collective farming, women in groups of paralegals, women in groups of widows, women in groups of survivors of violence, uh, if these women are not organized and they are not attending meetings and setting their priorities, then we cannot be able to scale up development uh, with the women. And most people shy organize funding organizing, uh, most donors want to fund real tangible results like we want to see how much food you produced, we want to see how much things you planted, like they go with numbers, numbers, but the organizing has never been really tapped as a big power uh, that has been uh, sustaining development, especially for amongst the women. So that's something I would just encourage that the participants who are listening, let's look at how to cost organizing. Let's look at how to support organizing, particularly for the grassroots women. Let's use this opportunity of the Agenda 2030 to really see that 
women are organized, they can speak to themselves in their communities, they can speak to other women the way we speak with women from Burkina Faso, Global Fund has not, cannot, must not be there for me to speak with the women that were in the meeting in Nairobi, to speak to the women in Uganda and share practice. I think this is what we need to encourage and I really appreciate all of you for listening to me. Thank you, Violet. Um, before we let you go and before we talk about the call for next month, I just wanted to invite you. Is is there a story that you could share with us? Is there something that really touched you as this process went on or that you personally learned? Something that you could share with, with us on this call? I think uh, the, the things that I would share in this call and the stories are actually very many. Like I'm looking at this group uh, which is called Mundulu. This group is just uh, a group that we brought together of women who are living with HIV. And uh, they came together because of psychosocial support, not that they would uh, actually encourage each other and encourage on how they are taking medication. When this program uh, with the Global Fund for Women Agriculture came, this was our first group that we thought of. How can we also teach them just from uh, not looking at psychosocial support because they were very poor. We need to actually help them to understand uh, on in, the need to improve their economic power so that they can be able to sustain their nutrition at household level and be able to care for the orphans that they were left behind with. Because some of them are taking care of orphans, not just in their own families, their sisters' children or other neighbors' children who died from HIV. And this group started with doing the demonstration plot and replicating in their forms. Then we taught them on savings and lending. This group has now started their own. They have their own adult literacy class, which was launched by the area chief, because the women were actually demonstrating how that it's important for them to keep records. And it's just amazing that the first time we could go to these groups, they would not even write their names. The participants would not write their names on a participant list. Someone had to write for them. But now even a woman of 60 years is able to do her name on the participant list. She understands how much shares she has put in the savings and lending uh, uh, of her group. She knows how much money she's supposed to pay. And they have integrated everything, including a health mutual fund, and they are paying for their health on the National Hospital Insurance Fund. They walk to bank to pay their money on their own. I don't have to be there for them to send their money. Or they do their banking on mobile. This is, has actually been a very successful story, and the women are being documented every time. And they are, doing, they are diversifying their livelihood, making bricks. Like they look at seasons and know what is it we can do, even apart from agriculture. And they have the big catering facility. I think these are stories that you can actually, and you, we have individual women that you can pick from these stories, like there's a woman called Beatrice from this story, who is just now amazing, and her church has even given her a big position in the church, which they would, she, they would, she, they would not give her five years ago because they didn't feel she had the power to lead her in, in her church. I think this is really showing how uh, a women economic empowerment through agriculture can actually be a vessel that can drive women to the farthest ends that no one can ever imagine. Of. That we are talking about education, we are talking about uh, 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 leadership. I think uh, that's one amazing story that I always look at and share every time and I feel like I share and I feel like even crying to say, why didn't we start this earlier? Thank you so much. Violet, we can't, we can't thank you <laughs> enough. Um, the stories are incredible, and I, I think everything that you've just said really underscores why we do what we do. Everything is interrelated. Everything is connected to everything else. And if you, you make those kinds of changes in a woman's life, she has the power to absolutely change everything. So, Violet, thank you so much. And I know it's late for you. Thank you so much for being willing to take the time to be with us. I'll look forward to following up with you, and we'll certainly look forward to sharing with everyone on the call. I wanted to take a moment to transition and thank you all for joining us on the call today and for your participation and support of Global Fund for Women. I want to also invite you to join us next month, the 13th of April from 12 to 1 Pacific time. We have dedicated to another 
very important and right now very timely uh, in many, many headlines issue around the Zika virus and, of course, the intersection with conversations about reproductive rights uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Specifically, we're looking at Brazil. You may know that Global Fund for Women will be traveling to Brazil in just uh, about five or six weeks. And I think that we're looking forward very, very much to having this kick off what will be a series of deeper conversations with our grantee partners on the ground dealing with this issue day in and day out uh, in the country of Brazil specifically. So if you're not already, already signed up, please do send us an email on RSVP to join in on that call. And we'll look forward to talking with you again soon. Thank you, everyone, for your time, your attention, and for your support. Have a great afternoon.